Hey everybody, this is Erica the Technology Nerd Likes to Film Stuff, and right here I have the hugest box possible from OnePlus. Thank you, OnePlus. I don't know where I'm going to put this, and I could probably fit inside it, but I believe this is the OnePlus 5. Okay, so we've got this little cloth bag here, which I'm sure is protecting the inner bag. Oh, it's a backpack, and I'm a fan of backpacks really big fan of backpacks. I don't like purses, but I do like backpacks. Ah, so this is a OnePlus travel backpack. Very, very nice. Okay, so I'm guessing the box is probably in here. Let's go ahead and open it up. Yep, and I was right. Here you go. So this looks like a media kit of some kind. Ready? Oh yeah, that's nice. So opening it up, let's see, what do we got? So it looks like we've got a reviewer's guide right here, dual camera, cleaner photos. Now I've been hearing a lot of opinions surrounding the release of this phone. A lot of people are pretty happy with the specs where other people are just not so happy, especially when it came to marketing, yada, yada. I don't wanna jump on the hype train. I just like looking at a phone for what it is. So let's keep it that way, shall we? So it looks like we've got a compartment with lots of cases here. Now I've actually always really liked the little cases that OnePlus makes. A lot of you guys know that I am not a fan of cases. And if I am going to use a case, it better be as minimalistic as possible. And that's kind of what these are. They're just like shells. They're not really protective or anything. So we've got four different cases right here. We've got an ebony, we've got a rosewood, a sandstone, and a carbon, like a carbon fiber looking case. And then this is the compartment, I'm sure for the phone. And yes, it is. All right. How do I I'm sure this convenient little hole is for my finger? Indeed it is. Oh my goodness, I have no room to put this. And the phone itself. So this is the A5000. This is the Midnight Black 128 gigabytes with eight gigabytes of RAM. That's a lot of RAM. Is this phone actually going to be able to utilize all that RAM? I don't know yet. I am hoping though with this spec set, the Snapdragon 835, that this is a nice and smooth phone. Here is my Galaxy S8 Plus and I have affectionately named it Mr. Jank. I like this phone a lot, but it's not the smoothest. Hey, what are you doing? I have an intruder. He's in the way as always. Would you just stay? Okay. So let's go ahead and open the box. Ripping off all the plastic now. Okay, now here we go, very slowly for effect, opening the box. And you do indeed see it saying dual camera, clearer photos everywhere. And I haven't been hearing the best things about the camera so far. Now I would hope that just with some updates that things would change. So I don't wanna judge the camera too heavily right now upon first release. So here we got the phone. Let's go ahead and just take this plastic off. Take off my little serial number. And right out of the box, it has a screen protector on it. That's nice. I'm going to rip that off right away. I don't care for screen protectors. Don't like them. Don't want it. Bye bye. Is it oleophobic underneath? Yes, it is. You see, I've made that mistake of ripping off a screen protector and then realized, oh, there's, there's no oleophobic coating underneath. Not, not good. Not a good deal. So the first thing that people say is, oh, it looks like an iPhone. And I pick it up and I'm like, yeah, Okay, I mean, maybe a little bit with the way that that dual camera sensor is on the front, but it's got this curve to it that the iPhone doesn't have. So it doesn't immediately step out to me as iPhone actually. One thing that does immediately step out to me as iPhone-esque though is the way that they have this plastic for the antenna band. Same thing for the bottom too. So here is my product red iPhone, and you can see it right next to the OnePlus 5. And really, I think that the iPhone is kind of more bulky and less graceful looking than the slope that we have here on the OnePlus 5. But really, each to his own, if it looks too iPhone-esque to you, that's just fine. It does feel pretty thin and also light in the hand, but it does have a substantial weight and feel to it. And we do have a headphone jack there at the bottom, so that's a definite plus. What else is in the box? So let's go ahead and lift this up. It looks like we've got the standard fare of documentation and things in here. It looks like we have a quick start guide and also the SIM ejection tool there. 
and a very nice shot that was taken with the OnePlus 5 in Iceland, nonetheless. All right, let's take that out. And it's the letter that we usually see from Carl Pei. Then we've got the cable for the dash charger, and I have really loved the dash charger. That is seriously the fastest charging that I have seen. I also have the dash charger for the car already, so that's going to be nice when using this. So that is all that is in the box. So now before we move on, I'd like to take a second to thank LastPass for partnering with me to make this video possible. So in this digital world, we all have a ton of passwords that are easy to forget. And one of the worst things that you can do for yourself to make it easier is to use the exact same password for everything. And a lot of people do this. This is where I have turned to LastPass. It's a password manager that relieves the trouble of looking for passwords and anxiety around getting locked out of my accounts. You don't have to write, remember, or reset passwords. They keep track of everything so that you can stay sane. Only remember one master password to enter the vault and keep the rest locked up and easy to find. Everything is encrypted, so not even LastPass can access your information. Not only do they keep track of my passwords, I also use LastPass to autofill my passwords right when I need them. And I can even add fill forms that contain address and credit card information to make my purchases online easier. Their services work inside of your web browser with a plugin or within their mobile app so that all their services work across all of your devices. Put your passwords on autopilot with LastPass. Check out the link in the description if you want to try them out. They are free. So here we are several days later. I figured I would spend as much time with this phone as I could over the weekend so that I could get as an informative review out as possible for you all so I could let you know what I think. If I need to create an after the buzz type review later on after we get a lot of updates, then I will do so. So the first thing I want to say to you guys is the more I use this, the less it reminds me of an iPhone. Yes, we do have a very similar sensor placement and all this right here is placed very similarly, but it just doesn't feel anything like it. And I was telling you guys that earlier, especially once you slap one of these cases on it, it really looks and feels nothing like an iPhone. So if that is part of your apprehension, don't let it be. Which reminds me, I do want to show you all of these cases that we have here now that they are out of their boxes. I was saying that none of them are very protective. While most of them are indeed shells, we actually have one that's more like a case. This is the carbon one. And you can see it's got little covers for the button cutouts as well. The only thing is that when I do this, it just kind of looks cheap and feels cheap to me. I don't like the way that this lip looks. It reminds me very much so now of the Nexus 5. So if you guys are wanting to preserve the beautiful look of the phone, I would get the sandstone one. It's definitely less slippery this way, plus the OnePlus 1 and OnePlus 2 came with this cover by default. Then we've also got the rosewood option, and I forget what this last one is called. Although I think this is probably my favorite wood option. I think it looks premium and unique. Just lift this one on right there. There you go. And it doesn't look too bad. I just happen to not like the wood grain look of this particular case. So overall, you could probably call this device inspired by the iPhone, but with adding cases to it and just using it in day to day, it really doesn't look or feel like it to me. I do have to admit though, when looking at the back, I love the way that this looks and feels, although it's really slippery, but the front does look quite a bit dated. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's more or less this huge fingerprint sensor that we have down here. Right here, I do have all the other OnePlus devices if you want to have a little bit of a comparison to see what this looks like. Let's wipe this down. It does get fingerprinty quite quickly, but wipes off nice and quickly as well, thankfully. So here we have it next to the OnePlus One. This was very well loved, got sunscreen all over it, so it's oily looking. OnePlus Two, that's where we started getting this USB Type-C connector at the bottom. Then OnePlus 3, and this was my overall favorite phone of all of them that they've made, and probably one of my most favorite devices of all time. I really loved this light gold color, and I liked the shade of white that they chose for the front as well. It just looked classy to me, felt classy, and I actually prefer the way that this feels over the OnePlus 5. That curve ends up making me feel like I might drop the phone a little bit easier. So that gives you an idea of the look. And then of course we've got the OnePlus 3T which is the exact same design as this, except for I have the black front. So there you are. So let's go ahead now and take a quick look around to see where everything's located, and then we will get into talking about the performance of this device. 
So on the back here, we've got a dual camera. One is the wide angle lens and the other one is the telephoto lens. Although honestly, it's got the focal length of a portrait type lens. Definitely not a true telephoto. Same thing with the iPhone. They say that the main wide lens is 16 megapixels and that the telephoto one is 20 megapixels. So we've got a microphone right here and also a dual LED flash. By the way, there is no optical image stabilization for either of these lenses, which is a bummer. We've got NFC, but no wireless charging. Then taking a look at the bottom, we've got a standard headphone jack, thankfully. We've got a microphone, USB-C charging port, and also a single speaker. Then taking a look at the front, we have a 16 megapixel camera, ambient light sensor, proximity sensor, also the receiver. At the bottom, we've got a fingerprint sensor, and we've also got some capacitive buttons, which you can interchange to being the back and the recent. I also don't want to forget the LED notification light that we do have right here as well. Then on the right hand side, we've got the dual SIM card slot, also our power button. Then finally, looking at the left hand side, we've got our switch. So we've got the silent mode, do not disturb, and then just all notifications. And also the volume rocker. And let's not forget that 5.5 inch 1080p AMOLED display, which is manufactured by Samsung, so we can call this Super AMOLED if we want. Optic AMOLED, again, is just simply a marketing term that they use. It has to do with their calibration of the display. Now let's first move on to talking about specs and performance. It has 128 gigabytes of UFS 2.1 internal storage, like my Galaxy S8 Plus. It's got 8 gigabytes of RAM, the Snapdragon 835 SoC, a 3,300 milliamp hour battery. This is a spec beast, the true nerd's phone. Around the interface, this feels like a nice and smooth device. It is very responsive. Scrolling for the most part feels nice and smooth. I do see some frame drops here and there, but overall the experience is good and I really enjoy using this phone. If you guys follow me on Twitter, I had some unexplainable hiccups in the very beginning, but it's been sorted now and I haven't seen that again. So with that UFS 2.1 storage, launching apps is very quick. I have also found app switching is a breeze and feels very darn near instant. I really love that as this is the first device that I've had that running apps kind of feels more akin to a desktop experience. And expanding on that, as far as RAM, we have eight gigabytes and that is a whole lot. So as a comparison, the Galaxy S8 has four gigabytes of RAM to do everything with, including all of Samsung services. So that gives you an idea of the performance potential. So I am mostly excited to see what the developer community is going to be doing with its eight gigabytes of RAM. And ideas could be something like allocating part of that RAM to just one aspect of the phone to improve performance. So now looking at how many apps I can actually keep open, this feels like true multitasking, finally. It's kind of ridiculous that we need eight gigabytes of RAM to do that. I can easily get close to 20 apps open, and that is including several graphic intensive games, the web browser, etc. So while keeping a close eye on RAM, I can see that once unused RAM hits about the 2.2 to 2.3 gigabyte mark, some apps start to restart. And yes, this is reproducible. So this is just some behavior that I've noticed, but still we can get tons of apps open and app switching is pretty much instantaneous. So holy cow, I am really happy with the performance. So how about CPU and GPU performance? Well, many benchmarks used to compare across other devices are out because OnePlus is boosting CPU speeds to peak performance whenever it detects benchmarks that are tagged in their code. And they've done this because they want to show what the peak performance of the phone is, but that's not really useful if you want to compare it to other devices. It just ends up looking like cheating. The only reason I use benchmarks is to look for useful trends in performance and just to compare between devices. Otherwise, I don't find them interesting to look at for everyday performance. What I found interesting with this though is that Carl Pay mentioned that resource intensive apps such as 3D games also get this boost in performance, but I haven't been able to reproduce this with my CPU and GPU monitoring. You can easily tell when the CPU is being pushed to peak performance by using an app like System Monitor or even Qualcomm's Trepin. So you can check all that I am saying here for yourself. So what we're seeing is that the four little cores are boosted to the 1.9 max gigahertz when this performance boost is employed. And sometimes I see this happening with the bigger cores too. So with all this that I just told you, I was able to check some real world performance not affected by cheating. 
And I did this with GameBench, which lets me see how well the phone performs with graphic intensive games and how long it can sustain peak performance. What I found in earlier reviews is that the Snapdragon 835 is a champ when it comes to performance in graphics intensive games, as it can hold peak performance for a while before any thermal throttling kicks in. And it's the same thing with the OnePlus 5. This is a great performer. Also having a 1080p screen only helps in the graphics department as there are less pixels to drive. So on my GameBench Riptide tests, I can get the device to sustain near 60 frames per second performance during the entire 15 minute tests. I'm telling you guys, if you like to game on your phone, this is the device to do it with. And just so you know, seeing performance like this is not a stretch because my Xperia XE Premium, which renders everything as 1080p, also sees these same scores. So I think with the Snapdragon 835, 1080p is the way to go. And at this price point, this is fantastic performance. So now moving on to talking about the quality of this display. We've got several different calibration modes, which is really nice to have. We got the default, the sRGB mode, DCI-P3, and custom color. Only two of these modes actually conform to any calibration standard. That would be the sRGB and the DCI-P3. So how close are these to meeting those standards? Well, during my measurements, I could see that their actual color space coordinates are pretty darn close. So yes, we can fairly call these the DCI-P3 gamut and the sRGB color gamut. When doing further measurements, I can see that both of these modes on my device have a white point that is a bit too warm and looks slightly yellowish because the blue color channel is a little bit too low. The gamma is a tad bit high, but not bad, so image contrast looks just fine. The color saturations aren't perfect, but not so off as to look horrible. So I think with these calibration modes, they did an admirable job. They're not entirely accurate, but they're pretty good. But do keep in mind though that you need to view the proper encoded content for each of these modes for your images slash content to look right. So for DCI-P3, you need to view DCI-P3 encoded content. And for sRGB, you need to view sRGB encoded content, which is basically all consumer content, web, YouTube, even the Android operating system and all the apps. So if you want color accuracy overall, use the sRGB mode. But honestly, for me, because these modes have that bit of a yellowish tint, I end up going for the default mode or even the custom color mode because I would prefer a bit cooler white point any day than something that looks kind of yellowish. But I am willing to bet that there are some variations across devices. I see that all the time with AMOLED with white point, there are a lot of variations. So mine looks a little bit yellowish under these modes, but yours might not. So how about this display only being 1080p? I think that most people are going to be just fine with it unless they have a trained eye or a quad HD display to compare it side by side to. I can tell when holding the 1080p screen side by side with the S8 quad HD panel that the pixel density is not as high, especially because of the diamond pentile matrix on the OnePlus 5. But for power efficiency and performance, I think this is an okay trade-off. It's still a very nice display with a great contrast ratio and punchy colors that people so often love. So I wouldn't be all too worried about it. So now moving on to talking about battery life with this device. This has got a 3,300 milliamp hour battery inside of it. That is not a bad size, not at all, especially with a 1080p display. We do not have wireless charging, but we do have that extremely fast dash charging. That is my favorite charging system of all the devices that I have used. When your battery is depleted, just plug it in and at just a little over an hour, you will have 100% battery charge. That's impressive. The other thing I really love about their dash charging system is that you can have it plugged in and still use the phone, have the display on everything, and it's still charging at a fast rate. If I try to do that with any of my other devices like the Galaxy S8, charging slows to a crawl, so I have to kind of just leave the device alone while it's charging, otherwise it's not gonna charge very quickly. So in the event this does not last you through the day, just plug it in, sit, continue doing your work, enjoying using your phone, it'll still charge up quickly. So that dash charging is amazing. Battery wise, I can get this to last me through the day, but once I start running tons of applications on it, taking pictures, doing a lot of intensive things, it does not last me through the day. But again, with that dash charging, I am not worried at all. This is one of those devices that as long as I know I can plug it in, I'm not worried about battery life, period. So now let's move on to talking about these cameras and I will wait for future updates to really assess the camera performance as obviously this device just came out, but I did go and test it out a bit. 
So this is a dual camera setup, but neither of these lenses is optical image stabilization, which is a bit of a bummer. In some modes, we do have electronic image stabilization for video though. So the main camera is a wide angle lens, while the other is the telephoto lens. We've got an f1.7 aperture and an f2.6. And the idea here with providing two different cameras is to provide two different focal lengths while preserving detail because you don't have to digitally crop in order to zoom in. They fubbed the marketing a bit though, implying that it's got two times optical zoom with this telephoto lens when it's only 1.6 times optical zoom. And then they add digital zoom to achieve that total of two times zoom. And then after that, they upscale that crop to 20 megapixel resolution. So they're marketing it as two times lossless zoom and not two times optical zoom. But I don't see how you can even call that lossless. The data just isn't there for the claimed 20 megapixel resolution. So for this, I really don't understand the point of adding two different focal lengths if it's not going to truly be lossless and you're just going to add a crop onto the zoom. Anyhow, I do notice that they do suffer in lower light environments, particularly the zoom lens, because with its small fast aperture, it can't let in enough light. And high ISO images with fast shutter speeds look noisy. So I would only use the telephoto camera outdoors in perfect lighting for the best results. The wide angle lens has a much wider aperture of f1.7 to let in a lot more light, but it doesn't have optical image stabilization. So it's subject to motion blur at longer exposure times. Basically in perfect daylight, you will have a hard time taking a bad picture with these cameras, but as soon as you get into shade or lower lighting type of situations, that is not where it shines. Another thing I'm noticing is that they are extremely heavy handed with post image processing. It's so overly processed that no detail remains during a crop and it looks like watercolor painting. This is where I don't want to judge the camera until after we've had a couple of updates to give them a chance to fix this. But there is a lot of potential here. I did take some video as well and I noticed that it's best to stand still when you're filming because then you get a lot of compression artifacts as soon as you start moving around and that's on all modes. And I found that it's best to use the 1080p mode if you're going to be moving about because it is electronically stabilized. It does crop quite a bit, but that stabilization does help, provided you're in good lighting. I wasn't so happy with the 4K mode, but I can see that it does have a lot of potential. It's very shaky when you're moving about. And I noticed that the image quality looks pretty soft. It's often hard to tell that it's 4K. So I'm really hoping for some improvements. These are just the thoughts that I have right now. As it stands right now, these are good daylight cameras, but not really indoors or for really low light situations. Quickly taking a peek at the camera app, a lot of people are making fun of it for looking very iPhone-esque, especially when you touch here for the zoom to switch between the two different cameras, which by the way, when you do hit the zoom button, that telephoto camera is not always executed. It depends if you're in good lighting or if you're trying to get really up close to a subject. It's going to actually just use the wide angle lens and crop. It's the same thing with the iPhone, so that's really not shocking. Let's go ahead and cover this up so we can see what we're looking at. So taking a look at the various settings around this camera interface, you have the option to turn on or off the flash or auto. You can choose your aspect. There's the HDR setting on or off, also the timer to take a picture. You can see we have option for photo, for video, portrait. There's a pro mode, time lapse. So a motion panorama, so a very full featured camera. You also have access to getting to the video setting and camera settings right here. So if you slide here, you have just the camera and this gives you your depth effect, which I've tried out and works pretty well when it does work. Other times it makes strange choices and blurs out things that shouldn't. This is where an update can be helpful. Now, I really respect that they have a pro photo mode. It's nice. You've got a little histogram here if you want to see how things are exposed. Here you have a meter to make sure that things are balanced. Here's exposure compensation. Here you've got manual or autofocus. You can mess with the shutter speed. Keeping the shutter open to up to 30 seconds. That's where you're gonna need a tripod for that. You mess around with the white balance and you can see you can mess around with the color temperature with the Kelvin scale, that's also nice. And you can mess around with the ISO. And another cool thing is that we have the option for raw. Very, very happy about that. So some things may be laid out a little bit like the iPhone, but overall, there's just so many settings here. This is not that much like the iPhone. Maybe inspired by, but really not like it. 
Oh, and then finally, you have the option to switch to the front-facing camera, that 16 megapixel front-facing camera, and there's your gallery. And of course, if you so desire, double-click on the power button to execute the camera. So overall, this is a very nice phone. I have everything set up just how I want it. It looks like you can add your own custom icons. I always love it when a launcher includes that by default. These are called sketchy icons, by the way. I really like the options and settings that we have here underneath the shade. We've got a couple of new things, such as the reading mode, which is pretty cool. It's going to make everything in grayscale. And it tells you, depending on ambient light conditions, reading mode will automatically adjust the screen color temperature. Now, I really wish that they gave me the option to do this myself. You also have the option to automatically turn on for these various apps. So for Kindle, for example, I can automatically just have it go immediately to grayscale. Very easy to get out of it. Just turn it off there. I have always, always loved this toggle switch that we have here. I don't have to go and fiddle around with the do not disturb mode. They make it very simple on you. Do you want to get notifications? Yes, then keep it here. Do you want priority notifications? Yes, keep it here. Do you want it silent? Yes. I always love it when you have options to customize your buttons. You can have the on-screen navigation if you want or just use the capacitive ones here and you can choose what orientation you want them in. I chose just to have the standard being able to pull up multi-window if I hold down on the recents key. But you don't have to, you can choose whatever you want. You've also got your gaming do not disturb mode, which I find actually really useful when I'm running particular benchmarks that end up pausing or getting kicked out of if somebody sends a text message to me or something. So that's been useful if I wanna be in an application and don't wanna be bothered. Of course, we still have our gestures such as double tap to wake. You can draw these various letters in order to gain certain control to access certain applications. So they only work when the display is off. All in all, this is an excellent phone. This is particularly a nerd's phone. And where I'm most excited is to have developers start working on it, create custom ROMs, and really utilize all that RAM or allocate it to specific type of things, get this phone being just even more awesome in performance. Is it better than something like my Galaxy S8 Plus? Well, what I really get with the S8 is a particular type of experience and a lot of features. It's really a Samsung ecosystem. Where with this device, I'm more free to do with it what I feel like. And it's got the type of specs to support that type of attitude. So this is all that I want to say about this phone right now. Great phone. I think people are going to be happy with it. There's a lot of people who are not happy right at this moment, but just give it some time. I think for the price, this offers a lot of great features. So this has been Erica, the technology nerd likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think. Let me know if this is your next device. Hope you enjoyed the video and have a good night. Bye!